Okay. Hello, everyone. Welcome to another episode of Lane Bites, the podcast about computational linguistics. And here is your host, John Pito. And in today's episode, we have the privilege of chatting with Daniel Jordan. Daniel Jordan is an NLP engineer, and he has also he has always been interested in the intersection between technology and language. In his career, he has worked for a number of startups and has been drawn to find the applications for his linguistic expertise. He's also interested in trying to make machine learning more accessible and understandable to the general population, bridging digital gaps and providing open source data and systems. His research interests include speech recognition, natural language understanding, semantic modeling, low resource languages, and machine learning operationalization. So Daniel, thank you for accepting and thank you for coming. I hope everybody will learn a lot from you. Well, thank you very much for having me. It's very kind of you to invite me here and uh, a pleasure to be with you to, to chat this through. Okay, thank you. Um, so as usual in our channel, uh, the first question is what we call a random question. Something more personal, a little bit about the opinion of the guest. And your random question is, which weather do you prefer, cold or warm, and why? It's an interesting one, actually. Um, normally, I would say cold. Normally, uh, you know, I would rather be out and feel the chill in the air, uh, you know, the wind. It, it makes me feel snug when I come back inside, and it's kind of a little bit of adversity uh, when you're out. But this summer in the UK, we've, we've not really had much heat, much warmth. And so I feel like I've had no real summer, no real sunshine. And so I'm really missing the warm at the moment. Uh, you know, I want to go somewhere where I can go to the beach and feel the the heat on my face. Uh, so normally I say cold, but today, today I'd say warm. Okay. okay. Good. But you know, here in Brazil, we have, we are having like a, a, a heat wave, a super hot heat wave. Oh, really? So I'm like, I really prefer cold than super hot. Yeah, I, I would rather it be too cold than too hot. Too hot, it's really unpleasant. Yeah, me too. I agree. So thank you for that. Um, now we're going to uh, the competition linguistics career topics. And the first one is um, a kind of a question that I'm doing to everybody. Mm -hmm. um, you have a background in both linguistics and computational linguistics and data science. So could you share how your academic journey has led you to specialize in NLP and what sparkled your interest in, in specializing in NLP as well? Yeah, sure. Um, it's an interesting one because even looking back, sometimes the steps I was taking at the time didn't seem like immediately clear or distinctive. But on reflection, it feels like there's a much clearer path than I perhaps realized. So, I mean, I, as a child growing up, I was always interested in languages. And when I went off to secondary school, um, so that's like when you're 11 in the UK, um, you know, I was learning French and Mandarin Chinese, as well as really being interested in English. Um, you know, and there was opportunities to do uh, Latin and kind of classical civilization work as well. So I really started to engage with language at, at that kind of young age. Um, it, it, in primary school, not so much, but certainly when it started to get to a point where you could acquire these things and do, do it as a, a choice, you know, I really enjoyed that. But I never imagined I'd be working in language. I always, always was interested in science. You know, when I was five or six, I said I wanted to be an inventor. Uh, and I've, again, I've always been interested in building things. You know, you see the Lego behind me, that's, that's not an adult passion. That's something I've had ever since the beginning. And so I think I always was, have, have this draw and drive towards science. Um, but I also love language and I kind of traded off these two things. You know, I, I remember agonizing over whether I should take three sciences at school or, or just the two, uh, because in the English system, that's the choice you're faced with. And, and I took just two in order to be able to keep on studying French and Latin. So it was mm -hmm. always a choice. And then when I went away to university, suddenly it stopped having to be a choice because I realized there was this thing called linguistics. Um, 
and I, you know, I started, I, I wrote a very poor, very kind of 16 years old kind of blog on etymology and kind of historical linguistics. And that was the angle where I think my interest had been cultivated at school. I had a couple of excellent teachers uh, in French and in Latin, and they really helped foster my interest in kind of the similarities and the, the etymologies and the historical changes and the sound patterns and stuff like that, which drove my interest in towards linguistics. But I then found when I was studying linguistics that like there was this whole science to it as well. And, you know, I think sometimes when something's described as a social science, it gets a bit of a, a soft kind of attitude towards it. But like some of the statistical methods in corpus linguistics and, you know, some of the computational linguistics you can do and some of the kind of math based theories, uh, yeah. uh, you know, if you think about computational phonology, that, that was very crunchy and very interesting to me. And so I immediately gravitated towards that sort of thing. And I remember I, you know, I was, I was thinking, oh, in my linguistics degree, oh, I'll, I'll probably end up with a career in academia. You know, at the time, as I said, it wasn't very clear. But I, but I did a third year module that was about uh, the kind of ethics of artificial intelligence. And it was this great module because it was 50% watching movies, you know, like 2001, A Space Odyssey and My Dinner with Andre. Mm -hmm. You know, everything from like the kind of stereotypical role of AI, but also like philosophy about what we mean when we sit down and we talk to each other. But the other half of this course was an introduction to programming in Python. And, you know, this is like Python 2.6, 2.7, um, to build out a chatbot, uh, you know, based initially on like Eliza and this very sort of old school idea of stuff. But, you know, we were assessed on how well we could replicate a kind of human behavior. So I, I, I built one that was just like one massive loop. And inside the loop, you had different kind of conversational paths you could follow. And that really sparked something. So after that, I worked as a research assistant for a while. Uh, mm -hmm. Well, I did that during my studies and then when I finished as well. And that was kind of corpus linguistics focused. And it was very interesting. Um, but a lot of the work was quite manual. And I found myself writing software to automate some of those boring tasks, you know, writing regular expressions to get bits of corpora or to format my data. So, you know, I didn't realize it at the time, but I look back now and I was starting to really work on like data pre-processing and corpus management and, and semantic separation of this data. You know, it was all keyword matching, but it's still those very kind of early stage things. And I, I didn't know what I was doing. You know, I, I think my supervisor would probably be horrified to hear me say I didn't know now, <laughs> but like on reflection, I could do a much better job. And I, I think most people as they get more experienced would look back on what they did in the past and, you know, Crit criticize themselves. And I, I think it's easy to do that, but also on reflection, that led me to where I'm going now. So having done that, I took uh, a year to do a master's degree at the University of Edinburgh in speech and language processing, which is a, a fantastic course uh, led by Simon King, who is, you know, one of the, the forefront kind of voices in the speech recognition, computational speech world. And that was a grueling year of intense, intense, intense study that really brought up the maths and the kind of statistics and the physics of sound waves and stuff that I had not touched since I was 16 and brought that up to a standard, uh, brought my coding up to a certain standard because there's some, a big difference between a while loop and understanding like class structure in Python and, and object oriented programming. And all of this kind of came together. Um, and then I was fortunate enough to, you know, be on the cusp of kind of generative AI and, you know, transformer architectures had been being developed while I was on this master's degree. And attention is all you need was, you know, the big paper, just as I was writing my, my dissertation. Um, and so that was a perfect time to really be coming into industry. Uh, so mm -hmm. I, I worked, then for a, a startup called Homex, which, you know, used a brilliant combination of uh, kind of neural network based language processing tools and knowledge graphs and other kind of semantic reasoning strategies uh, with a very supportive and very experienced and knowledgeable team that, you know, tolerated my mistakes and gave me patience to 
to not necessarily succeed at everything I tried, but to still kind of pick me up and encourage me and, and help me learn those lessons. Um, and now working at Relative Insight, which is another startup uh, here in the UK, I, I try to keep learning, but I also try to provide opportunities for other people to learn from the things that I've that I've been able to do. Right. So that, that's a that's that's a monologue for you. Um, but <laughs> I'll ask questions about the things that interest you most. Yeah, yeah, you answer the question. Thank you. And um, one interesting thing that I would like to draw attention from your monologue um, is that you you started in computational linguistics seem kind of similar to what I did. Um, first, I, 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 be, I began as a purpose linguist. Mm -hmm. Then I transitioned into a uh, um, computational linguist. Mm. The, the lab that I work in right now in my dissertation, for my dissertation, um, they are mainly purpose linguists. Mm -hmm. But they have since maybe 2020, they have incentivized the students, masters, undergrads, and PhD students to transition to computational linguists. Uh, interesting. So they they kind of forced us to learn a little bit of programming, a little bit of statistics, mm. and then they say like, stop using Anticon. Anticon is, is a great tool. Use I don't know an LTK. So yeah, they 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 um let's say uh, they forced us, but not in a bad way. In a no, way. no, in an encouraging way to yeah. to broaden your tool set, right? Yeah, because that, that's really what corpus linguistics is. It's it's application of tools uh, to allow for linguistic knowledge to be applied at that kind of scale. Yeah, I agree. Yeah. It's it's interesting actually. I think I think there's a strong academic history and tie between kind of corpus linguistics, traditional corpus linguistics, and computational linguistics, as you say. Um, the the startup that I work for at the moment started out as a university PhD project, um, doing comparative linguistics um, and, and identifying kind of statistical features in language that allows one corpus to be distinct from another. And identifying what those are, um, and and you know that was used for for child protection reasons and and identifying people who are pretending to be children online, and, and now of course the the technologies have matured and a lot more has come in and become more sophisticated, but it's still that kind of comparative corpus linguistics at the very very original core of it, which has become commercialized through the opportunities that you have from taking some of those things and really powering them up and amping them up with the kind of techniques that computational linguistics allow you to, to incorporate. Great. Um, awesome. I didn't know that. Um, and now talking a little bit about uh, computational linguistics per se and your experience in Relative Insight, the, mm -hmm. the other startup that you mentioned, um, to build this kind of technology, involves a combination of linguistics and data science, statistics, and STEM uh, disciplines, basically. Mm. So what is your opinion on the balance between these two words, like um, humanities with linguistics and STEM disciplines, and how do yeah. they have to collaborate, and how do you balance them out? You can talk about, for example, your team at the uh, your company, or you can talk about yourself. How do you do that? Yeah, it's, it's, it's an interesting question because I think it doesn't have one direct answer. It's very, very situational. And, and I think part of the factors to consider in that are your level of experience within a company that you're working in, uh, the size of your team, what your business goals are. And I, and I appreciate the people you know watching and listening to this may have differing levels of expertise and differing levels of expectation in terms of what they'd like to do and how they'd like to work. So I'll try and break it down a little bit more broadly and then give some examples to hopefully make that make sense. Mm -hmm. um, so, so for example, in my current day-to-day -day work, I would say there is probably 10% of my time using like the core traditional linguistics knowledge. 
And a lot of my time is spent doing software engineering and kind of machine learning development, machine learning model, kind of ML ops, kind of deployment, monitoring, hosting, uh, kind of applying DevOps and agile principles to uh, machine learning systems. So that's very kind of engineering focused and very kind of technical and specialized and scientific and using statistical tests and other kind of maths to use that as a warning sign to understand, you know, is your model working as you intend, stuff like that. So on my day to day at the moment, you could say, oh, well, much more of it is kind of that scientific side. But actually, I think the unique opportunity that people who have those linguistic skills have coming into this field is the ability to really offer that additional expert knowledge that you wouldn't necessarily get without it so for example um recently we've built out a french pipeline to analyze you know french language in a native way rather than being reliant on people translating their data into english and passing it through our pipeline okay. with all of the problems and challenges that doing machine translation on your language can uh you know imply you know, all of the errors that can be amplified out and so one one core example that helps with linguistic knowledge is being able to understand things like idioms and you know that can come from native fluency but it can also come from an understanding of how idiomatic language can be detected and that's very much you know talking about corpus linguistic strategies um mm -hmm. or understanding like different ways of modeling semantics the, the favorite example i have before the, is a case study of what an error we found very early on in our development was that we had a whole load of medical French data we were looking at. And, you know, it was all customer or, or originated. So it was from forums and things like this. And, and people were talking about sucre les fraises, uh, which means sugar, sugar your strawberries. And, and so, you know, a, a traditional semantic model would tell you, oh, there's something about sweetness or fruit or food or something like this, until you understand that that's an, a French idiom for people whose hands are shaking. Um, because that's what you would do with sugar over your strawberries, right? But it's actually talking about, you know, tremors, and that's a medical symptom, but not being talked about in a scientific way. Mm -hmm. And we only found that by using kind of traditional linguistic techniques uh, that you wouldn't necessarily expect to find, or if you did use just kind of your more computational linguistic approaches, you might miss it because you don't have that kind of language-based understanding of the data. Um, so that's one example. But I think there's another sphere which has been missed when we do this distinction between like linguistics and, and you know, traditional STEM. And that's actually the fact that a good 60, 65% of my time is not spent doing the technical work. It is about the communication and the collaboration to be able to actually achieve those business goals. So that means working with different stakeholders. That means working with developers who perhaps don't have the linguistic or the ML knowledge. It means working with customers and product owners who have ideas about how language works and how they want to use language, but maybe don't have the technical groundings in the same way. Uh, and I think there is something about linguistics in the way that it's taught, which can help you there, because at least when I was taught, you know, the formal linguistics program, you're, you're taught to be descriptive rather than prescriptive. Uh, and, and to kind of shy away from prescriptivism as a whole, but particularly when it comes to talking about language. And that gives you a unique opportunity to be motivated by the evidence of what you see in front of you. And, and the data that exists rather than preconceived notions about what you think things ought to be or how you think things ought to behave. And, you know, it, it doesn't matter whether you're talking about people going out, you know, in the wave after Noam Chomsky, uh, track, chasing the syntax of the world's languages or the phonologies of the world's languages and kind of the fourth floor experiments in, in New York, like all of this kind of descriptive data collection, data analysis, and then using the patterns and the trends in that to paint this really vivid and complex picture of the world's languages. Well, if you're working with language in your domain for, for a company, you know, you need to be able to do the same sort of thing. 
Um, and if you're really talking, I mean, Relative Insight is a, a text analytics company and we, we want to drive metrics out of people's unstructured data. And so being able to take that kind of linguistic brain uh, and, and apply that and not have strong assertions about your pre previous and prior expectations is a really valuable skill there. So that's where linguistics comes in, not on a technical way, but actually those biases um, or, or more to the point, the ability to think about removing them is a really valuable side to that. And having, and having this linguistics brain, as you said, mm. helps um, finding resources to mm. scale to scale the, the, the solution. Absolutely. Uh, and also sometimes can provide opportunities for, you know, applying that expert knowledge in, in ways to make impact really quickly. Um, you, you know, it, it's not such an easy example nowadays because with ChatGPT coming out, summarization is very largely a solved task. Um, but prior to that, in terms of summarization tasks, you could train a big machine learning model and still not be particularly convinced by the quality of the summarize or a summary that came out. But if you were to, for example, take Grice's uh, maxims in terms of how we should expect communication to look, you could potentially you know, evaluate your summary based on those things. And if you've got that expert knowledge and you understand Gricean maxims for what communication should look like, then you're, you're set and you're away in a really advantageous way because you've suddenly got a metric to be able to evaluate the quality of the things that you're generating with machine learning that is different to the kind of automated approaches that it otherwise exist. Yeah, that's true. And it will be based on a linguistic theory. Absolutely. And, 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 and there's a lot of linguistic theory out there. And some of it is perhaps quite niche and some of it is highly contested. Um, but those theories still often have merit and have an application in, in domains that otherwise people might not be familiar with, especially as computational linguistics and kind of language processing is becoming more democratized, which is a good thing. We, we, you know, we want that bar to be as low as possible so that people can really engage with language. But it does mean that there are fewer, or the proportion of people, I suppose, with that kind of expert training is, is lower. And therefore, there's an opportunity to be able to share that knowledge and, and democratize across a team. Um, I, I'm very lucky in my team where I'm, I'm not the only person with a linguistics background. But for those of us that don't have a linguistics background, you know, there's often a, an eagerness to learn and understand what the, the expertise can provide. And of course, that goes both ways. You know, there's always opportunities for, for, for me to learn more about software engineering, for me to learn more about the voice of the customer and the product. Sorry? There should be uh, an exchange, right? You can yeah, absolutely. Yeah. They give them the engineering part and, and exchange yeah. information. That, that's exactly it. And, and finding the ways to share that effectively is is really interesting in itself. Mm -hmm. Great, great. Uh, now I would like to go back a little bit on your career, because mm -hmm. as you said earlier, and this I think this is a very hot topic, uh, especially in linguistics. Um, you've trans transitioned from an academic position as a research associate to an industry uh, role as a data engineer or NLP engineer. Hmm. Um, so can you share with us a little bit what factors or what influenced your decision in this in this shift and yeah. how did this role influence how the academic uh, role influenced now your um, your performance on the industry position? Yeah, it's it's a really interesting question and it's one that I think it's almost a two statement because I I did. It. Okay. Yeah, so I, I think it's a, a really interesting question. And I, I think it comes almost with a two stage answer. Uh, so mm -hmm. so as, you, as you quite rightly say, I, I had this uh, paid research position between my undergraduate degree and my master's degree. And the reason for stepping away from that and going to do my master's degree are slightly different to kind of how I then transitioned into industry. So I, I think the the paid research position um, I really enjoyed 
and I really got a lot of almost self-worth and, and a bit of confidence from being able to be paid for the work that I was doing and see the impact of the work that uh, I was putting in. And, and seeing that impact and understanding that uh, kind of the lessons that you were learning and the information you were gathering was really, really motivating to me. Um, what So the, the project I worked on was called Mwin Berla, um, which was all about the kind of differences in language use uh, across different demographics on the Northern Irish border, um, particularly in the wake of the Troubles uh, and kind of the peace movement after 1997 in that area. And so I was getting kind of verbatim information and, and kind of semantic information using tools like Sketch Engine to manage the corpora, um, to, to really dig into what we know about native Irish people and first and second generation migrants to the area. It, it was fascinating, but what I really enjoyed was actually speaking to my my supervisor, Karen Corrigan, and seeing what she was actually getting out of the work that I was collating and the database that I was administrating. Uh, and so that was really cool, but I, I yearned to do something a little bit more concrete. It felt like I was contributing to a, a research project, but I didn't really see what the end impact on people's lives was from that or kind of where it went. Um, and the academic world is, I think, often like that. It can become difficult to see what your, you know, your specialized niche is and where that goes and what impact that has and how things change. And of course, some people do manage to have a dramatic amount of impact in the academic world. But I started to guess, I guess, become disillusioned that that would be a way that I'd really be able to do things. So I went away to do the master's degree because I kind of wanted to apply the things I'd learned in linguistics to a task because I thought maybe if I could do that, then there would be an opportunity to, to see what that impact could look like. So I wasn't really thinking about a career or any career goals at that stage. I was just thinking about well, almost like with Lego, you know, it's like, okay, I've got, got all this stuff that I know, but I want to apply it and I actually want to build something. So, so the master's degree seemed like a perfect opportunity to be able to do that. And thankfully, you know, that that hope was was, was surfaced and made true um, because I, I learned a lot on my master's degree, but a lot of it was actually assessed on what you could do and what you could build. You know, you had to write a neural network in, in code. And, and, you know, as I say, going from this kind of very dodgy looking chatbot to actually building software that maybe did things and simulating language across different agents and things like this. And, and, and so that really got the fire going, I think, about mm -hmm. taking the linguistic knowledge and applying it. Then in terms of the actual step from, because, because you could absolutely pursue a, an, an applied path through academia. And, you know, I had friends that went and did some really interesting research that was very applied, you know, things like, uh, automatically identifying speech uh, based on brainwave detection, you know, use, using magnetic mm -hmm. imagery. Uh, and so, I, you know, I was thinking, oh, wow, think about the, the accessibility opportunities for things like that, uh, being able to detect what people are wanting to think or to wanting to say just while they're thinking it, if they've got some sort of voice impairment, that would be, you know, a magnificent tool to be able to put out. Yeah. That's great research. Um, and, and so that could have been a path for me, but actually more by coincidence and luck, uh, my, my girlfriend, who's now my wife, um, got an opportunity to work down in Cambridge. Uh, and so I said to myself, well, you know, I, I've done this degree up in Edinburgh, but let's move to Cambridge. That's a great center in the UK for kind of AI innovation and, and language technologies. So it just, almost by coincidence, but also kind of a bit of a strategic decision, I suppose, was then to see what startups were around down there and see whether doing things in industry would give me that opportunity to have the impact that I hoped for. And, and, and I've got to be honest, that's where things really shifted for me because starting to work at a startup 
And I, you know, I was the third hire on the, the Cambridge science team. Oh, sorry. I was the fourth hire on the Cambridge science team. Um, that suddenly opened up this door of being admittedly in what was at the time a smallish pond, but actually being able to apply the knowledge I had and the, use the skill, skills I built and really hone them and, and ultimately get the value out of them, not by what someone said on an assessment or like some pressurized test environment that was supposed to try and capture everything you did, but actually by having like daily usage of whatever it was I built. So I remember the first thing I built was like a, a text classifier, you know, just grouping it into buckets. Mm -hmm. But but that classifier got used in a piece of software downstream. And after a couple of months, like I could see how many thousand bits of text I'd separated out. And then I had visibility of like what that did in the long run and how that made money and how that made people's lives easier. Uh, and that was the impact I was looking for. And I think mm -hmm. that's where the startup bug really kind of bit me because it's like, wow, okay, you've got the opportunity, you know, as, as a fairly inexperienced, you know, new, fresh out of school, kind of halfway linguist, halfway developer who didn't really feel like they belonged in either camp to, to see the opportunity to really do something and, and get that value out of it. Yeah. And, and it wasn't always smooth sailing. You know, I certainly had a lot of times where I struggled to make that impact or, or perhaps, you know, through my own inexperience or lessons that I'd yet to learn, um, had struggles with doing what I thought I could deliver. And, you know, this is not to mention COVID coming in and the disruption that that caused. I mean, I, I don't want to retread over COVID. We've all lived through it and experienced our own traumas through that. But you know, it didn't help. Let's just go with that. But then learning how to do that better and learning from those mistakes, it's all an iterative process. And, and that's a way that I, I think about my career, how I think about my day-to-day -day work and how I think about really that transition. So does that answer your question? It's really yeah, almost it two different things. Yeah, it did. And one thing that I would like to point out from what mm. you just uh, talked um, is a very, for me at least, is a very important difference between industry and academia, which is, um, it is a, um, let's say, a very common phrase in the industry world would be a fast-paced environment. Mm -hmm. Because whenever you make, a you make a decision or there is something to change or there is something to add or something to take out, this is done like immediately, mm -hmm. like right away. In academia, there is a lot of bureaucracy that you have to go through the chief of department, and then you have to go to the chair of department, and then you have to go to the supervisor. And then when it's time to go back to you, it's been like months or years. Yeah. So I think uh, that's a very good difference if um, you like to see this impact very uh, straightforward or very quickly, because you need this type of stimulation, mm. then um, industry kind of had has that yeah and I, and I think not only does industry have it I, I agree with what you've said by the way uh, but I, but I think that smaller startup companies have a bit more wiggle room to have that faster pace and and the opportunity to learn from making mistakes as well yes um, mm -hmm. I, I think from conversations with colleagues at larger companies uh, or who have previously been at larger companies and actually also my experience of joining a team that was of four and com comparing it to when it was a team of like 20. You, you know, the larger a team gets and the more processes become solidified, that can slow things down too. And, and trying to recapture that ability to be nimble and quick and the way that you work is an interesting challenge in itself. But I don't think that the two have to be completely... Um, completely separate but it's very difficult i think when you are in academia to move quickly it's obviously you've got sort of compliance and regulatory things and bureaucracy that is in place for good reasons but even if you're thinking about you know the independent work you're doing as a, a researcher it's very difficult to know whether you've done the right thing because you don't have the oversight until the thing you produce at the very end 
So you don't have feedback coming back on that. And actually, if you yeah. did try and get feedback, it would be very manual and very, you know, imagine imagine going to your research supervisor every two, three days to say like, is this right? Is this right? Is this right? You you would actually not get good feedback in the end because you would be, it would almost be like the boy who cried wolf. Um, mm -hmm. Whereas in, in industry, when money is changing hands, people have a, a direct kind of pressure and an incentive. But therefore, the process of getting that feedback to understand whether you've done the right thing is also incentivized, or at least can yes. be. Mm -hmm. uh, and so, yeah, I would say people who feel driven to get that that kind of signal back, um, perhaps you know, looking at industry opportunities is the is the way to go for that. Um, now, I'd like to touch on another tap in another point that you talked previously. Um, you said that your work um, has a percentage of, of communication, dealing with people, stakeholders, a part with software engineering, and another percentage with linguistics. Mm -hmm. um, so by having this triple, triple um, day to day activities, what are the some most valuable? Um, Sorry, I, I couldn't quite hear your question. Yeah, there is like a, a motorcycle passing by. I'm ah. sorry. Um, so what are some of the most valuable or interesting or competitive skills or certifications you believe someone must have or should have as aspiring NLP linguists mm. um, to be uh, able to enter the field? So... I think for entering the field, it, it, again, there's there's no one size fits all answer, and and of course it depends what your motivations are and what your aspirations are. You know, there's a different set of skills required to be a data scientist versus an ML engineer, and there's a different set of skills required from being an ML engineer to being like an ML ops engineer. But I think that there is a lot of overlap if we're thinking about it like some sort of Venn diagram. You know, there are things that uh, intersect as well as being distinct skills. Mm -hmm. um, particularly from a linguistics background, I would say if you're looking to go into one of these sorts of fields, I think having an understanding of modern software development processes is a really valuable place to start. I, I think if I'm interviewing people or if I'm looking at their, their CVs, if they've got a GitHub profile and they have a project where they have asked themselves a question. You know, you know, there's an example recently that was on the news this morning of a, a man that trained an image recognition software system to recognize foxes and badgers on his garden to set off a noise deterrent to send them away so that they didn't uh, mess up his garden for his kids. And you know, I, I, I and I think to myself, like, if you could get like if I saw that from someone who was looking to get into the field, that would be obviously a, a you know a, a gold a gold dust moment. But I wouldn't let actually being able to deliver that or fear of not being able to deliver that be a barrier. Um, I think if you've got a question that you want to try and answer um, about language um, or using machine learning, Having a case where you can say, oh, well, this is what I've tried, and this is what I've implemented, and this is why I've implemented it. You know, apply some linguistic knowledge to say, okay, I want to try this algorithm, or I want to try and do this task, because I know it should be possible. The theory says it's motivated by this. And then these are my results. It doesn't matter if you actually don't even have running software. You know, if the software doesn't work, it's unfortunate. And yeah, there are bugs, but that would give me a perfect thing in an interview to say, okay, well, let's let's go through your project and let's see where the bugs are. You know, what what why do you think it doesn't work? What is it you don't know? And the candidate that can think critically about, you know, the things they don't know and the areas of their skill set that are weaker, but has not been afraid to give it a go and try and not let fear of failure stop them from putting something out there. That is a a really useful skill, specifically in industry, where, it, where, where, as you say, you do get this signal and you do get this mentorship and this encouragement to, to try things out and to succeed. 
no no engineer no machine learning engineer no data scientist comes into this field knowing everything and companies and businesses are really domain specific you know they all have very different individual priorities and different problems they're trying to solve and so you know even if i were to change jobs tomorrow i think if i went into a new company it would take me even with you know five years of experience six months at least before i'd feel like i'm up to speed and kind of understanding the software and understanding everything that's going on and the processes and the motivations and why so you know i wouldn't expect a new graduate applying for these jobs to have that sort of understanding out of the box but if they've been able to show that they've tried something and they've thought about why it might work and why it might not and where they would like to try and take it next and where they could see that plan going that's the signs of a self-motivated learner, someone who's inquisitive and someone who's prepared to kind of try. And I, I think that would be the skill above almost anything else that I would prize, particularly if that person was then able to communicate in an interview about what and why they did these things and, and explain their motivations and what their stakes are because that's what you need to be able to do in a business sense. You're not always going to be talking to experts and to be able to have the impact on the things that you want to have an impact on. You've got to be able to manage different levels of expectation as well. So yeah. I, I think that's it. And then of course there are other things and there are other skills and there are lots of things you can learn by following, you know, tutorials online or watching you know, high quality video lectures, there's so much content, so much knowledge out there now, that in a way you can almost become an expert in a very self-motivated and self-driven way. You know, follow, follow, follow a tutorial and that's great, but I'd much rather see someone who's followed a tutorial and then tried to build something different and not had it succeed than someone who's got a GitHub repo full of just like eight or nine tutorials that are followed letter for letter because I don't know then where their individual direction is coming from. Yeah. Does that make sense? Yeah, it did. And also, um, I have said previously uh, on another videos, but um, about communication, and especially mm -hmm. talking with people who are not experts in linguistics or NLP. Um, I think we as linguists, we have a, an advantage on that mm. because we are usually, well, at least in Brazil, usually linguistics is also combined with language teaching. Mm, interesting. Like a linguistic slash literature slash language teaching course. Yeah. Like the three of them combined most, most of the time. Um, so therefore we kind of we are kind of trained on how to talk to people who are not experts. And then we, when we translate that to the industry, mm. we tend to be more uh, didactic when we are talking to people, especially engineers, for example, they don't know any, anything about linguistics mm. or one or two things about linguistics. Or when we are talking to, I don't know, managers who are just like business managers, uh, I think we have this, this advantage of talking to, let's say, lay people about mm. what we are studying or what we are doing. Yeah, I, I, I think you're, again, I think you're right. There's, there's something, and it's certainly not unique to linguistics, but I think it is more commonly explicitly taught in linguistics programs mm -hmm. that encourages you to strip away kind of the ego um, and not be too over opinionated on what you know and why you know it. And I, th I think, as you say, you know, the, the, the idea of combining it with teaching uh, language isn't necessarily a common sharing in, in English systems that I'm familiar with, but it's not uncommon for people who have done linguistics degrees to then go on to teach English as a foreign language. So I, I think there is that kind of aspect of being prepared to share your knowledge and share your understanding and your motivations and also to be tolerant towards questions and not mm -hmm. not not to dismiss people's questions or lack of understanding or, or you know discard something as a silly question yeah. there's no such thing as a silly question 
And, and if it's about being able to expand someone's knowledge, then it's valuable. And I, I think, yeah, there is a a separation. I, I, I think it's about low ego. Um, yeah. that, that is, uh, it, it, it enables collaboration. And that's, mm-hmm. it, 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 it's not a perfect thing. Not every linguist is going to be, you know, egoless. And I don't think egoless is true. It's just sort of that ability to respond. You know, it, it almost sounds very big headed of me to, to say that. Mm-hmm. Uh, and it's certainly not true that engineers uh, wouldn't also have this capacity. You know, some of the finest technical minds I've ever worked with, you know, have followed the, the kind of ideal of, of strong opinions loosely held. Where, where they've been able to form a, a, a strong and concrete technical idea, but also are prepared to adapt to changing circumstances or, or needs. But I, I think you're right that linguists do have that skill and, and that it's valuable. It's definitely valuable in business. And to wrap up, uh, my final question or my final request to you mm-hmm. is uh, for people who are watching, and they are aspiring to be a career in computational linguistics and NLP, data science. What advice or recommendations would you offer based on your journey or someone else's journey that you that you've seen? And what can you say then? Like in words of encouragement. Yeah, words of encouragement. I, I think listen to as many people as you can and that's why. And be prepared to hear. Well, well, listen to me if you choose to. Certainly listen to the other excellent voices that have been heard before. And and do your best to kind of raise the the profile of people that you've heard that you think are interesting. And engage with those people. You know, the world of computational linguistics is still fairly small. Um, And you'll be surprised who you can contact and who you can connect with and who you can discuss ideas with who are very like-minded and very interested in similar problems to you. But the other side of that is pursue things, especially if it's, you know, as part of trying to build a portfolio or, or part of like trying to get into some novel skill, perhaps. Pursue things that you find interesting and, and that you just have a passion for. And it sounds very easy to say, oh, well, follow your dreams, you know. But, but, but I mean that in a, a very tangible and concrete way. And I'll give you an example. Um, When I was working on my master's thesis, you know, I'd done the kind of core bit of my work, but I I wanted to see if I could apply what I'd done to work with the Cornish language. Now, Cornish language is a a low resource language, so, so low that there were only two resources that I was able to find for it. One was a PhD thesis that was written in the late 1940s, but I reached out to the guy who wrote it. He was retired and living about 20 miles from my parents. So I, I emailed him and spoke to him and he was like, oh, it's amazing you've reached out, but no one has reached out about the thesis I wrote all these years ago. Um, and, and so I, you know, we, I, I got that conversation going. And the only other source I had for working with Cornish was from 1897. So that's how low resource it was. It, the, and the work that I did, you know, I built a speech recognition system for Cornish based on morphological uh, separation, um, which was an interesting project, but it's never going to be applied in anything. No one speaks Cornish as a first language. Uh, and only about 400 to 2,000 people speak it as a second language, depending on what level of fluency you want to consider speaking. And, and all of those people... I'm certain also speak English. And so we'll use the speech technology systems that we have in abundance in English. So you might say, oh, well, what's the point of doing all this in Cornish? But the answer is, you know, I was interested to do something to contribute in this tiny little way to a thing that not very many people care about, not many very many people are motivated yeah. by. But also it might just be possible that I've made the only speech synthesis and speech recognition system for this language that will ever exist you know if anyone's listening and thinks oh this is a great idea please go and do it because you'll do it better than i did i did not do a great job but the point is it's there and 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 it was interesting for me growing up in cornwall 
you know, hearing the language spoken at festivals and during ceremonies, it felt like something worthwhile. And actually, when I was interviewing, it was that particular extension that set me out from, you know, potential other candidates, because no one else had tried something like that. Uh, and and I definitely wouldn't have done it if I hadn't just been kind of intellectually curious and driven by seeing whether it was possible. So mm -hmm. don't worry about like doing a thing people will find useful. Do it for your own curiosity and do it for your own kind of sense of value, because that way you'll have the motivation to be resilient to failures. Uh, and if it stops being interesting, you know, move on to the next thing that is interesting. You know, don't saddle yourself with the expectation of perfect success. Perfection is the enemy of progress. So just look back and be glad on what you've achieved. That's true. Wow, great, 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 great. So thank you, Jordan. Thank you very much. Sadly, yeah. this is the end of the episode. Um, thank you for coming. Everybody, thank you for watching. Hope you like it. I learned a lot of things with Jordan and with Daniel. Sorry, Daniel, so far. I, I'm sure you, you've learned as well. And pay attention to the, the listen also to the other episodes. And Daniel, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you very much for coming. Thank you, Joao, for having me. I, I really, I really enjoyed it, and I really appreciate you giving me the opportunity to to join you on this show. Of course. Thank you, everyone. Bye bye. Bye.